Yeah. <coughs> so um, Sue asked me to talk about. Um, so I did a few iOS apps and a few mobile apps. Here are some of them. And Sue asked me to share some of my experiences in that I had while upgrading my app from the first version to the second version. The app is Speech Timer. So, it was 2008, about the same time when the iOS SDK was officially launched. I was doing Toastmasters. Toastmasters is an international franchise of public speaking clubs. Its objective is to improve uh, the members' public speaking skills and organizational skills. I was part of the executive committee of the Barclays Capital Toastmasters Club, so it's an intra-office club. Being an ex-co means that I also, also help organize meetings and keep it going. One role that I had was as a timekeeper. When I was the timekeeper, I often forgot to look at the stopwatch and signal the time, <laughs> especially if the speech was good. Another problem that I had was I was forgetting to carry the stopwatch and the time signal flags. So that was the inspiration of speech timer, to get over those stopwatch, time signal flags, and not to forget about signaling the time. Yeah, this is how a Toastmasters meetup usually looks like. So it's bare bones, no projectors, no fancy stuff, just you talking. In, in the in the crowd, there will be people who uh, who measure the time, take the time. People who take your um, will let's see, uh, keep track of your grammar. Say, for example, if you have too much pauses or you do like um ah, uh, they will count your ah, uh, they will count your um, you count your stuff, and be a general evaluator that generally evaluates how you speak. So, what is Speech timer. Speech timer is stopwatch for public speakers. There are three important time marks while speaking. Green, meaning that you've spoken enough, long enough already to qualify. Yellow, meaning that you have to finish quite soon. And red means that you've talked for too long and you're disqualified. These are the example timings of a typical Toastmaster speech. You need to speak for at least five minutes. At the sixth minute, you need to finish, finish up soon. And speaking for seven minutes or more, meaning that you'll get disqualified if it's a contest. But on regular meet, meet, meetups, meaning that you just don't get an award or something. But, but yeah, shown here is an example device that's used in Toastmaster speeches. So the timekeeper will look at the stopwatch and then at the green time, at five, five minutes, we'll raise up the green flag. At six minutes, we'll raise up the yellow flag. And at seven minutes, minutes we'll raise up the red flag. Yeah, the development of speech timer, active development of speech timer goes from 2008 to 2011. Then I refocused my efforts to other applications, primarily because I've left Barclays Capital and then I couldn't find any other suitable Toastmasters club, meaning that it's going to be really hard for me to serve the niche correctly if I'm not actually um, interact heavily with that niche anymore. But in 2013, this year, something happened. A guy contacted me and he said he wanted to build hardware that interfaces with speech timer. It's a traffic light style signal. <laughs> yeah. This is the actual image that the guy sent to me. So he wants to connect his gizmo there using the audio jack to speech timer. Yeah, so the, the, he said that um, send this sound to trigger the red signal, send this sound to trigger the yellow signal, and send another sound to trigger the blue. The green, the green signal. Yes. But changing speech timer is not straightforward since current Xcode doesn't support iOS 3.13. Remember, this was done in 2008 and after 2011, 
And then if I want to do anything, I have to basically revamp the whole thing because it doesn't support uh, iOS 3.13. So it's time for version 2.0. Pretty good time to upgrade customers to iOS 7 look and feel to make it worth the effort and support for the iPad and the Mac as well. So why do you need to be here to listen to all of this crap? Well, you learn a few things. For one, how to support iOS, iPad, iPhone, and Mac OS 10 on the same code base. You learn how to migrate your user interface from iOS 6 to iOS 7. You learn something about iCloud, primarily core data on iCloud. How to save data from your Mac to iCloud and onto your iPhone and Mac. And last but not least, how to handle external displays, be it projectors, Apple TV, or just another monitor. So, how Apple do, do its transition from iOS 6 to iOS 7? Let, let's take a look at one of their own apps, an app that is not part of the core iOS. Here is an example of the podcast app. At first glance, You'll see that the 3D effects have mostly been removed, except for the volume control over there. Right? And you'll see that there's another subtle change. Notice the color of the text button, speed 1x, speed time over there, and the buttons on top. Yeah. Those are purple. Why purple? It's the application's tint color, and it should be applied consist consistently throughout the app. If you notice that the major color of the icon is also purple, so, purple is the identity of the podcast app. Let's say, take a look how Evernote did it. I selected Evernote as an example because they try really hard to support every platform that they support as best as they can. Why? Evernote is essentially a software as a service offering, meaning that you need to pay yearly or monthly to access their, their application. Usually, software as a service or SaaS, businesses are pretty satisfied just to support a web-based interface or maybe provide a cross-platform lowest common denominator app using, say, Adobe Air, um, PhoneGap, or Java. But Evernote, they really do their best to integrate with every platform they, that they sell their applications to. So, as you can see, the notebook metaphor has been removed. But I mean, notebook is that the um, fake 3D effects of a notebook from iOS 6 have been removed and they become a dashboard in iOS 7 that gives you a glance of what your content is, which is pretty consistent with the iOS 7's content-first approach. Less um, Chrome and more content. By now, users have grown up and no longer require notebook metaphor. So they, they know where to tap, hopefully, and doesn't need to, to have a false Fox 3D interface. Being less geomorphic also gives you more opportunity to display the Everon green branding. See, it's all green now. So, how I'm doing it. Speech Timer was designed to emulate a physical stopwatch with colored LED indicators. Notice the uh, Fox LCD display. I was trying to emulate the classic 5GB iPod or the classic Palmas displays that were, uh, that were popular at the start of the century. And it tried to follow the gist of the times to emulate a, another device, to make the iPhone emulate another device, another physical device. Now, with iOS 7, I set up to remove as much Chrome as possible and focus on the content. Notice the timer light indicators, the, the one that says green, yellow, red, have been moved upwards to integrate it with the timer lights because there's no need to emulate a false LED display anymore. And there's the, the center area if the, the content is made bigger. And also, the buttons are flushed to the edges and we only have separators between them. 
and the speech types list also be updated to provide more 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 space to the content. Before that, this was a false LED lights with textual descriptions around it, and now we just might integrate the LED the content, which is the speech that itself with the indicators. So the numeric display and the color has been merged to provide more space to the content. Now, how do you do dual platform? What does it take to support OS X and iOS from the same code base? For that, let's see the differences between the two platforms. So, iOS, OS X. iOS is mostly on UI kit, whereas OS X is on app kit. So what? Doesn't matter, right? It's just a name. But iOS 7's user interface is mostly based on UI view, which is a region of space inside your screen that normally doesn't move, normally cannot be moved by the user. But on OS 10, it's based primarily on NS window. The user can move the window around, resize the window, minimize it, and all those things that are normal desktop computer are expected to do. And iOS, touch-based interface, some may be multi-touched, but OS X is still primarily based on a GUI cursor. And the coordinate system, iOS is based on the script, Western script coordinate system, where you go, go right and then go down, X, X goes to the right and then down. Whereas OS X is based on the Cartesian coordinate system. So you go right and up. Now, how do you support the iPad, iPhone, and OS X from the same code base? Here's one way you can do it. You have a separate UI code classes for iOS and OS X. Um, you base your iOS view controller and there's a mirroring hierarchy on OS X's window controller. You have several subclasses for iPhone and iPad so that you instantiate the appropriate, appropriate one as accordingly at startup. When you detect whether this is with this device is an iPhone, you, you instantiate the iPhone view controller. When it's an iPad, you instantiate the iPad view controller. Both can share the same um, model classes, but Often there need to be some, some common logic between the OS X and iOS view controllers or power window controllers. So you factor this out to the logic classes. Just, just uh, host the common code between window controllers and view controllers in iOS and iPhone, iOS and OS X. Yeah, and auto layout is your friend. These are screenshots of iOS version of Speech Timer on iPad and iPhone in portrait and landscape configurations. All of these are from one base view controller classes. And these variations are done by changing a few auto layout parameters. Whereas this one is from the OS 10 UI, UI. also using UI layout, also using auto layout. The bottom right window is the control window that takes out user input that you can that the user can use to set up the speech type, stop speeches, stop stop ID, uh, change the name of the speaker. Whereas the top left, top left is the presentation view. So the top left window is meant to be shown on a projector. So another way, this is how you usually do C core data objects um, so we have store. So for example when you start your app, you check whether the store file exists or not. And then you set up the first store. And if the store file didn't exist in the first place, you create new initial data. But on iCloud, checking the store file is useless. Why? Because there could be another another store file in iCloud already. And there's no way to know whether your data store was initialized, initialized for the first time. Then how do you do it? You just need to accept the fact that there's, there's no way to determine when is the first time your data store was opened. 
Therefore, you just set it up, prefill it, and deduplicate it afterwards. And some work optimization that you can do is to ensure that the data prefill is only done once per account per device. How do you do it? Uh, NS Fallout Manager's Ubiquiti Identity Token has a reference to the currently logged in iCloud account. You keep an, keep an array in NS system defaults and say that all for all the, the Ubiquiti identity, identity Tokens that you have done set up and then you check whether uh, you have I set up this account or not. If you have set up this account and then you just pass through. If you haven't, then you just do a prefill. Of course, there are other times when you need to deduplicate data. One is when you receive new data from iCloud. This likely to happen when the user starts using your application from a new device. That device would have seeded the data beforehand before it has a chance to download from iCloud. If you get this notification to the dip store, dip import ubiquitous content changes notification. Keep note that this notification doesn't get posted on the main thread, so you need to do dispatch to the main thread if you need to update the UI. Another case is when the persistence of file changes. This could be the user switching between account accounts, login, log out, or could be just be could be the iCloud just being dropped online, meaning switch, switching from the four pack store with a no account store into an iCloud store, or could be uh, simply that the software was open initially. Note that on the Mac, iCloud has an option to update your software even when your application is not running. So. Even if you have a or something, I want to update your cell file independently. Therefore, you will need to run the deduplication logic as the first step after you open your cell file, just in case there's new data coming from iCloud and it's duplicate. So, for more details about this, you can go to WBC session 201, what's new in Coreta and iCloud. You get Find new videos that when to duplicate, when the iCloud switches, what kind of notifications that you need to listen. And I also have a core data controller class that helps some of these um, notification management, setting up iCloud, and all of those stuff. You can check it out here as core data controller on GitHub. And then, how do you make presentations? On iOS, you get notifications when the screen, a screen connects or disconnects, you get these two notifications. So you can simply assume that this new screen is the presentation screen. That, and then you can just put up your UI to your presentation UI on that new screen. How about on the Mac? The Mac doesn't have such notifications. All you get is an array of screens. That's it. But think about this way. Some Macs doesn't have built in displays, like Mac Minis. Mac Pros, Mac Pros can handle four displays at once, and there's no way, no telling which one is the primary display. And there's so, for that, you only get an array of screens. Then the question is how do you find the projector screen? How do you find it? After long, I would say, no, not very long, well, after a bit of farming, I found a way how do you detect a projector screen. How do you find it? Simply find the biggest one. No, that didn't work for me because this thing is 1024 by 768. Uh -huh. Most of the map, most of the pros of the map, whatever it has, the high resolution is. Yes, <laughs> but that's the catch. Biggest one, not by pixels. Biggest one by millimeters. <laughs> yes, you can. Yes, you can. You get the biggest one by millimeters. Could it Could be millimeters. But if you cannot ask you as a user to pick it, which screen you want to pick it? Yeah, that's true. That's true. But as a default, you can assume one. You can assume the biggest one as a default. As a default, in case, uh, well, in case someone 
Biasa biasa sama dengan masa sukses dengan iPhone dan dengan bisnis itu tutup dengan tangis ini. Betul sangat baik. Tukar tembikis mana? Bicara. 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 Thank you. 